Hallo und herzlich willkommen bei Passives Einkommen mit Peer-to-Peer. -Peer. Und heute gibt es wieder ein Interview und zwar mit Debitum Network. Heute geht es um die Due Diligence der Kreditgeber, denn wie wir alle wissen, in der heutigen Zeit ist es immer wichtiger, hierbei transparent zu sein und das Ganze den Investoren auch ordentlich näher zu bringen. Und ich glaube, es gibt kaum eine Plattform, die das besser macht als Debitum Network. Das gesamte Interview ist natürlich wieder in englischer Sprache gehalten. Um euch die Navigation ein bisschen zu erleichtern, habe ich euch allerdings hier und da ein paar Timestamps in die äh, Beschreibung gepackt. Wenn du das Ganze lieber auf Deutsch sehen willst, ich habe das ganze Video nicht untertitelt. Ähm, es gibt allerdings eine Aufarbeitung davon auf meinem Blog, die erscheint am Samstag. Also wenn du das lieber in Deutsch sehen willst, dann abonniere einfach den Kanal und dann verpasst du da nichts. Für alle, die sich jetzt die volle Dröhnung geben wollen, gibt es jetzt äh, 40 Minuten Input von Debitum Network zu deren Kreditgeber Due Diligence. Viel Spaß dabei. So guys, we are here today to learn more about the details of the due diligence process um, of onboarding the loan originators from Debitum Network with uh, Sergey and Gütis. Um, but let's do it as short as possible so that we don't overwhelm the audience with uh, too much information. Uh, maybe we can make a short breakdown uh, around 30 to 35 minutes. Um, Sega, maybe you can start with some things um, you are looking for the start when you onboarding, when you start onboarding a loan originator. Yes. Um, hi, Lars. Um, hello, invest the investors. Um, we will uh, describe shortly, me and Gitas, we will describe uh, how we do uh, due diligence and how we onboard uh, loan originators. I will share my screen uh, just to show you one slide and uh, that will bring even more. I think it will be easy to understand that. Just a second. Okay, do you see everything, yeah? Yes. Okay, cool. So uh, what, uh, how we can split actually, I will, um, Uh, discuss, I will tell you about qualitative part of uh, due diligence process and Gitas will go into details and uh, risk assessment, etc. So, um, when we start uh, our uh, onboarding process, there is an initial, uh, initial, let's say, pre-selection pre of uh, loan originator. So, we check if this loan originator fits our criteria, like, uh, uh, It's, it should be only business uh, business loans, uh, uh, either business loans, invoice financing, trade financing, or uh, something like that. Because as you know, Debitum Network uh, works only with uh, business loans uh, in uh, Europe. Then we check, of course, like preliminary check if uh, there is no bad reputation uh, of uh, shareholders or management. And... Um, so it's like eligibility criteria when uh, that business started um, if they have enough uh, track record to to be on board it yeah so after a preliminary check when we see that uh, this company fits our requirements we can actually go to um, deeper due diligence uh, during uh, that due diligence we have like several parts um, so we analyze um, how they do their onboarding process um, how they uh, do collection, debt collection. Uh, we check their portfolio. Gitis will uh, go into details how we check uh, portfolio, receiving some uh, data from clients. Uh, then uh, what we also cover in this part, um, we check if, uh, if their business model is uh, sustainable. I will give you just a short example of how it works. Uh, Let's say uh, cost of fund uh, for that loan originator is 10%. Uh, then they have, uh, let's say, 5% default rate. Their operational expenses takes also 5%. So it's already 20%, uh, all of that. And then we check uh, what is the interest rate uh, which, they, um, which they offer to client. And uh, let's imagine that interest rate is 18%, 1.8%. So it means uh, they have uh, more cost than they actually earn from loan originator. So it, this is model is not stable. And for us, it's like a red flag. We are not uh, proceeding with uh, that uh, loan originator. Uh, and uh, if their interest rate is uh, higher, so they have like, they can cover all costs and they have margin. 
to make some profit. So that's the case when we can proceed. Uh, then uh, uh, another important part of um, qualitative analysis is uh, uh, in-field visit. So before actually before we decide uh, either we proceed with them or not, we always do field visit. So uh, during field visit, we um, we have interview with top management, we have interview with uh, sales uh, team, we have interview with risk assessment, etc. And for us, it's uh, very important that we speak not only with uh, top manager, with CEO, uh, but also with uh, uh, key staff, because uh, CEO never operates business by himself. It's always about uh, other people in the team. And um, sometimes it's it's enough to see that uh, people who are making decision they are not competent, and then uh, then we will not proceed with that loan originator. Then uh, what else is necessary when we do field visit? We uh, we have some. Um, credit files we ask for specific credit files to to be checked on on spot so we are uh, let's say we don't prepare such in, such questions in advance so when we come we say okay please provide this credit file that credit file and we check if everything fits like uh, what was provided before uh, to us and what is uh, uh, what is on the field yeah so that's uh, also a very important part of um, analysis. Uh, and then after, uh, after all this part, um, we have a um, risk assessment, uh, which is done by Gitas. He will uh, cover those details. And then if we decide to onboard the uh, loan originator, we have credit committee, decision to onboard, and then we proceed with a, a partnership agreement sign, uh, signing and then uh, pledge, uh, pledge agreement, and only after that we can start uh, working with uh, that loan originator. Uh, yes, I would like to stop on that, and Gitas, uh, please uh, tell uh, what, just, what just, you do. Was just one question um, before. How long does it take to, for, for this whole process? Maybe some, well, some estimation. It depends. Uh, it depends on uh, loan originator. First of all, if he yeah. is um, how how quickly he um, answers our questions. But uh, usually, it takes uh, in our practice. It takes uh, like from the very beginning to onboarding. It's like six uh, sorry six weeks, eight weeks. So it's like up to two months. We cannot do it uh, faster. Okay, maybe we can do it, but I think thorough analysis uh, requires uh, some time because there are, it, it never uh, happens like that. So we just receive like all file, then two days uh, get us analysis and say, okay, done, let's go. No, it's always like uh, um, questions arising from those uh, documents. We ask the, those questions, we receive answers. We have like several sessions uh, like in Zoom or Skype. And then again, if you go to field visit, you have to prepare for that interview. You have to process this data. So it, it, it's quite uh, it's quite time consuming process, I would say. Okay, yeah, just to get a feeling how long uh, this onboarding process takes. Okay, so we can continue. Okay, so hello Lars, hello, hello investors, pleased to be here. So after Sergey has given a very nice introduction to our qualitative uh, due diligence part, uh, I will move to the quantitative. I'm responsible in the network for crunching numbers. So our process can be split into seven parts, I'd say. It's quite complicated for a process. So after we receive all the necessary data and answers to the diligence questionnaire, then we move on to crunching numbers, basically. So one of the first things which we do, and I will share my screen about that, is uh, we have our internal uh, uh, scoring system. Uh, I believe you can see it now. So this is like a pretty complex uh, uh, sheet, like system of evaluating as many aspects uh, of the loan originator as possible. So we start usually with the onboarding and scoring process of the loan originator, how they do their uh, customer picking, well, how their credit scoring model works, is it good, do they use like third-party risk assessors or they have some in-house good system, 
uh, if the system is average or like there are any very few criteria included, then we see this as a risk factor because uh, when we get assets, it's like then uh, an obligation falls of us on us that we need to again like do risk analysis for final borrowers, and that's we do not want to put that obligation, let's say, on ourselves uh, for the sake of our investors. Then we move to evaluating debt collection process. We evaluate how successfully it works. Uh, what is the historical success rate of these uh, de uh, debt collection procedures? Then uh, we actually uh, dig out like individual cases of late uh, assets and ask them how the process went, what was the issue. If the issues were actually not serious, let's say the debtor just simply didn't pay and we couldn't reach him, that we see as well as a risk factor. Uh, we value the most if the uh, debt collection is actually dedicated to the third party or the assets are insured. And then we move further to the very essence of risk analysis. Here we have, uh, it's simply expressed as numerical ratios. I will uh, explain more in detail later. But here we actually evaluate the performance of the loan originator's loan book. Uh, we take this part as the most serious part of our uh, due diligence process. This, this as Sergey mentioned, it takes the biggest part and uh, consumes most of the time for us because we really carefully pick up loan originators based on their loan book performance. So in that, I will go in detail a bit later. Then we also uh, evaluate soft factors like the uh, competence of managers and other key employees. Uh, we evaluate the shareholder structure. Let's say if the company is a startup, and uh, has been operating for a short while. And most of it's like equity and capital is owned by venture capitalists who, who is not totally involved in the business uh, and creates a big, big obligation to that company. We see that as well as a risk factor. And also we evaluate the maturity of the company. Then we also evaluate some, let's say, hygiene factors. Uh, as uh, uh, let it be data keeping standards, what uh, accounting standards do they do the company use, or uh, uh, based on the answers of the loan originator and the responsiveness, uh, we evaluate like uh, the sufficiency of the data they have provided and other uh, little, I'd say, factors which might cause like uh, big trouble if we don't evaluate them in potential future collaboration. And then we move on on covenants. Sergey will later discuss about these, but this whole uh, process is every aspect is evaluated. We have a scoring system at, for the sake of presentation numbers are deleted, but then we arrive at the final score. And based on that, we, uh, in our credit committee, we take this data in consideration and uh, make a decision from the risk analyst perspective, that being me, and I do a conclusion, Do should we move on with this loan originator or not? So as I mentioned previously, there is a big part of Avon analysis uh, is a cohort, uh, uh, cohort and loan book performance analysis. So here I have an example. On the very top, you, you see years and months. So this means is uh, these numbers show when the payment for loans issued at the dates on the left side, let's say, first example, we can click here, uh, how well the loan was uh, collected on the 12 months of 2014 in this example, uh, on the loan which was issued a month before. So this actually shows us how the loan, uh, how the loan is collected at the very beginning. And then we'll, we do that for every loan in the loan book. And we see a track record and the timeline of every loan issued per month. And then we see if we see some uh, let's say unusual factors. Let's say here we have that like suddenly we have a crazy increase in income while previously it was only very small portion collected. That was already a risk for us. That shows like that there is some inconsistency in collection of the process. So I have a bit different example. Uh, so this one is a summarized version of this analysis. So here it's much more digest, but uh, in one of the cases, this is a real life example, and actually this analysis sh showed us uh, really big problems of one of our uh, 
past uh, partners. And uh, uh, because of this analysis, we managed to identify that, uh, let's say, currently loans were uh, recently issued loans were okay, but loans which were issued in the past, they had pretty significant problems, meaning that like when their maturity comes, there might be an increase uh, or, or of non-performing loans and not collected uh, payments when the business still needs to be growing. So this is one of our tools which we use. So then we move forward and uh, if we are satisfied with the performance of the loan book and we have identified all the problem points of the loan book, of the loan originator, we will move forward to analyzing the, uh, analyzing the <clears throat> Uh, the general performance of the loan originator, financial performance. And uh, I believe, Lars, do you see the screen right now? Yes. Uh, Excel screen. Uh, like, does it, has it changed? Uh, no, we have summarized the work presentation. Yes, summarized. Okay. Yeah. okay, so I will show now other example. So uh, this is, now you see a different page, yeah? uh okay so this is our like summary page for loan originators again this is a real life example from our past due diligences so in using all this data uh, let it be cumulative issue of the loans uh, issuance uh, issuance and collection performance lateness of loans and other small factors we uh, estimate the and forecast potential default rate then we using this data we actually even adjust financial statements of the loan originator to we uh, plug in numbers from the loan book, meaning we change operational expenses, operational income to see what if we do like a stress, uh, stress test on the financials of our loan originators. And then we estimate uh, uh, what could be the limit for the loan originator, uh, let's say initial limit of funding through Debitum Network because we do not want to increase over uh, over expose ourselves uh, on loan originators if they are not capable of uh, covering those financial liabilities so there are as you might see very many factors considered then at the end we again have similar analysis as we just saw previously so uh, taking all this data we digest it we in, uh, analyze uh, uh, everything and then we come up to the, uh, to the final score which we plug in in the scoring our uh, template we ask uh, the final let's say follow-up questions for our loan originators on individual cases or if something is not clear on the finances and after that we hold a credit committee and then if the decision is positive as Sergey mentioned previously we move on on agreement negotiations so uh, uh, when we move on on agreement uh, agreement negotiations uh, then we actually go, go back to the finances of a loan originator and estimate the, the um, if the loan a loan book performance is sufficient we estimate the capital adequacy of the loan originator if the loan originator will actually be able to provide buyback guarantee it's not a marketing trick for us we uh, we estimate the real uh, potential of the buyback guarantee, the volume that the uh, loan originator could bear, and then we as the, uh, we see if that goes together with the limit established during risk analysis, and if everything is uh, uh, positive on the on all these aspects, then we move on to agreement negotiations, and then Sergey will present uh, the last part of uh, the diligence process is actually covenants negotiation yeah so um thanks it's very very uh, for me it's also even if i know all details for me it was very interesting get this thank you very much uh, so for, um, uh, i will mention like some covenants which are most important part um, as for me uh, and for for us uh, when we decide um, either to onboard or not so uh, first I would say it's debt to equity ratio. What does it mean? So it, uh, how much uh, money loan originator uses their own money, their equity, and how much they attract. And uh, in the best uh, scenario, it should be five to one uh, for 
let's say, regular loan originator is five to one. So for each uh, one euro of own money, they can attract five euro uh, of external money, external funds. In some, uh, let's say, uh, best loan for best loan originators, uh, uh, it also depends on some uh, other parameters. It could be nine to one, but this is maximum what we have, and no more of nine to one. We actually uh, expect to have. Uh, what it shows uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, let's have an example. Uh, company has a loan portfolio ten million. They have one million equity and uh, 9 million uh, of debt. So it's like, let's, let's take this example. Uh, and uh, let's say we establish for them limit of 1 uh, million yeah, for, for our platform. Uh, so that, uh, that means even if they have uh, like all loan, uh, loan that are on the platform in default, they are able to buy back that. Uh, so that's important co correlation between uh, their equity and um, and the volume on the platform. Uh, another important issue, what we have to take into consideration when we establish this debt to equity ratio is their default rate. Uh, and uh, we actually have it as a co covenant in the agreement. Uh, so for example, uh, our loan originator currently uh, has a 3% uh, uh, default rate. So that we, we agree with them. Uh, so. Uh, it, and covenant is established, so default rate should be no more than, let's say, three or four percent. So we can ex, uh, discuss that with them. If that default rate grow is growing uh, during our monitoring, what uh, what we are doing later, uh, we have to uh, check if they still have enough equity for that. Because if their default will grow, it means they will have to buy back more loans on the platform, and we have. Uh, have to make sure that uh, they have enough liquidity for that and they have enough equity. So that I, I would say uh, it's most important what actually even each investor uh, um, uh, should take care of or, and sh should consider like uh, what is debt to equity ratio, what is default rate of that loan originator and uh, if there is enough uh, actually equity to, to buy back all loans on the platform. Um, also, one of very important um, covenant that we establish, um, many loan originators, they're using uh, uh, shareholder loans uh, in, uh, in the structure of uh, their business. So for us, it's very important that shareholder loans are always subordinated to funds that um, loan originator attracts on the platform. Uh, it means uh, if you are if you are shareholder, you, you cannot withdraw money from your business before you actually repay to other investors, and that's one of our uh, rules. Okay, and uh, I see Lars. Probably we are running out of time. <laughs> you, you increased. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think for covenants, uh, that's that's enough information uh, at this moment. Uh, let's let's move. Uh, yeah, I think we can move on to the questions right now, if you, if you don't mind, uh, because as you mentioned, uh, we are running uh, out of time. <laughs> sorry, but sorry. But it's sorry. really cool and, and uh, see um, how detailed your analysis is and um, also to show it uh, to the investors. So good job. Thanks for this. Um, yeah, now it's really important um, during this, this crisis we have at this time to re-evaluate your loan originators because the situation is um, changing very fast. So um, did you made a new due diligence for every loan originators in, in March or how often you reevaluate your loan originators right now? Uh, I can comment on that. So yes, uh, our due diligence process does not end uh, at the moment when we onboard uh, a loan originator. So it's a, a constantly going process. So yes, we have a monitoring policy. Uh, before the crisis, we used to do that every quarter. And uh, recently, we started doing that on the monthly basis. So all loan, uh, loan originators are re-evaluated at the middle of the, uh, March. And now they are uh, monitored, let's say, on a daily, weekly basis. So yes, uh, on the follow-up due diligence process, we require the very same data as for onboarding uh, due diligence. 
So uh, that, that being loan books, financial data, for example, in March, we got uh, quarterly results, like first quarter results from all loan originators. We immediately revaluate that. And we basically do as, as same detailed uh, follow-up due diligence as the initial due diligence. For example, just recently we had a, a case, an example. For example, when we, we had assets on the platform, and we asked for the follow-up, uh, the, the diligence data from one of our loan originators. So what we, we noticed, for example, we started analyzing uh, assets, uh, asset by asset basis. And we noticed that some one client was like uh, not okay with us. I mean, the rating should be deteriorated. Uh, that on the platform, uh, it might be like a high rating, but actually the asset itself is not that good quality. So that we immediately took in consideration. We informed our loan originator that, uh, hey, you have this case. We do not want to have it. It's like too risky for us. And then investors might uh, need to wait too long to receive their money or it might go even bust to mm -hmm. buyback or de uh, the worst case to default. So we immediately informed our loan originator about the amount that needs to be repaid. And we Im immediately moved out the asset from the platform and the uh, paid back our investors the accumulated interest and then the uh, principal back. So yes, we do that very, very carefully right now. We uh, evaluate even the final borrower. We ask him for final debtor uh, documents to actually ensure that loan originators are not playing with the ratings and uh, not giving assets which are not as good as they think. So yes, that during this crisis, we take this like super, super seriously. Yeah, but it, this means, on the other hand, also that um, the loan originators need to be very transparent and um, they need to deliver, you, deliver you all the documents every month. Um, what would happen if um, one loan originator is not able to do this or yeah, don't want to do this? Do you suspend uh, the loan originator then from your platform? Uh, yes, and that has happened in the past. And that's what exactly happened when the loan originator was not able to give uh, clear answers, straight answers. Uh, yes, that is an immediate red flag for us. Uh, we start to, to search for reasons about, for that. But uh, in, in very short, yes, we just like stop uh, putting assets and we start que asking serious questions for the loan originator. Okay. So I recently talked to another loan originator and um, there came the topic up. Um, it was... Um, for them, it is easily uh, it is easy to to upload the same loans on different platforms. For example, if they are on Debitum Network or on Mintos, and at the same time on uh, on Evo or something like this, um, how you get sure that not the same loans will be uploaded on other platforms? Is it possible yeah. for you to to prove this? Um, yeah, I can comment on that. Um, actually, we have only one loan originator on our platform, which uh, works with um, two platforms right now, with us and with Mintos. And um, when that started, we actually were the first who identified that problem that could happen. And uh, what we did, actually, we worked with loan originator and with their IT team uh, to develop the mechanism how to prevent that. And uh, so we were part of that uh, de devel development of that uh, process. And we actually even tried to, um, to misuse the system. And uh, those uh, assets are blocked and uh, we, we are not uploading them. So it's, uh, for, for that specific case, which we have right now, I mean, one loan originator, which is using both platform, we, uh, we set that rule already. And, uh, before that, before uh, we automatized that, uh, we did it manually, so it was done by uh, by hand, uh, but we also were aware of that problem. And uh, for the future cases, that would be probably the same mechanism uh, what uh, what can be established. And uh, another, uh, it's, it's from a platform perspective, but uh, if uh, we speak about loan, loan originator side, because for loan originator, it's always uh, important to be sure that platform is not manipulating with their uh, loans. And we also spoke with one loan originator, uh, which uh, is in the process of due diligence right now. And uh, what that loan originator suggested that they will actually do on their, on their website, um, like for transparency reason, uh, they will post which assets are sold to which uh, which platform 
probably mm -hmm. it would be anonymized, but that will be, a, in any case, it will be easy to identify by volume, by date of issue, etc. So I, all, I believe it's like um, a process had, uh, should be done in, in both sides, not only from platform, uh, but also from loan originator. And uh, only in that case, when we actually, let's say, inspect each other, we control each other, loan originators, platforms, investors, uh, then it will be like more stable uh, mechanism uh, and uh, there will be very, very few plays for fraud in that yeah. case. Yeah, maybe we are talking about the same loan originator because Probably, uh, the one yeah. Yeah, uh, he came up with the same suggestion. Um, yeah, so that means at this time you have some new loan originators in the due diligence phase. So you don't want to stop like other platforms in this crisis to stop the due diligence. Well, yeah, to, to be honest, what we have now, we are not maybe that um, that big platform. So just we have to stop. And we were very, uh, very picky before crisis. So many, many loan originators uh, went through our due diligence and only a few of them were on board. And we don't want to stop right now because, uh, yes, there, there are some loan originators worse to be a part of platform. So why we should stop doing that? Um, we have uh, in pipeline, we have uh, like five loan originators right now. We have uh, one loan originator from Latvia. Uh, with um, agro loans, uh, which uh, which is less affected, I would say, by this crisis, and maybe even vice versa. Yeah, uh, and uh, I spoke with that loan originator, and this week, uh, so they actually have a demand from their clients, and uh, other clients, their current clients, they are paying back in 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 time, so there is no big uh, problem with them. There is another loan originator from Estonia with invoice financing and with, with SME loans, which also on the final stage of due diligence. We have a factoring company from Netherlands in our pipeline now, another one from Croatia. Uh, yeah, uh, and um, uh, and probably that, that's, and, and one from Spain, yeah. So that's our uh, pipeline right now. Of course, we are more careful than before. Of course, we analyze how this crisis affects affects their clients and that specific loan originator. But we don't want to stop our business and just to stay you know, like on the same level of what we have now. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is um, to one case you had in the in the past. It's about um, a forty uh, finance. Um, you paid out the investors by yourself. This is a difference between you and other platforms. Um, all other platforms, I think they have still problems with the and struggling to pay out the investors. Um, why you have chosen this way and um, what does it mean, mean for, for maybe future issues um, with other loan originators? I think they will come at some day. Um, will you do it the same way again to pay out the investors by yourself? Or yeah, maybe you can tell us a bit more about this. Yeah, so uh, A40 was a uh interesting case let's say it's a, it's a big case so i can like share a little like timeline how it all went and how we decided uh, to, to to do the in the way that we did so that uh, 40s is like uh, the diligence of a 40 was started quite a while ago let's say before onboarding them and actually providing assets on the platform so how it went that uh, previously we had a bit like let's say outdated way of like looking at one because we had like big experience in invoice financing but a 40 as you may know is like purely sme fine business uh, loans uh, like a loan originator and that is actually a reason why sergey with his like uh, bag of experience came to to debitum network and joined us to increase uh, experience in that field so yeah so we actually evaluated the 40 on the uh, a bit like older model of our diligence and on the data, which was uh, at that time for 2018 year. So everything looked fine. Everything uh, uh, seemed like okay. And that's like a 40 is like the biggest lender in Poland. So, and we are like a small platform and uh, why shouldn't we work with them? It's like, they are so big and et cetera, et cetera. Then actually it first problem started to start to come in because it was the uh, answer started to be unclear from a 40 side and then some strange things started to happen. So based on that, we 
uh, gathered together, updated our due diligence model. I joined that, I remember, uh, at Debit Network at that time, and that was the first case of mine. So we immediately updated our scoring model. Uh, we requested new new financial data from a 40. They, they were like, happy to, to provide it, that there was no problem. Loan book and everything was provided. So we ran, ran all the new uh, analysis we just like, previously showed uh, to you and the investors. So we ran through that and we started identifying problems. And then the, how can it be? It's like you know, everyone is silent and the port is so big, it cannot be so bad. And we were like uh, jumping back and forth for like three weeks or four weeks, like what to do with them and, and what not. And we already had like uh, there are three assets on the platform based on the previous analysis. But after the new one, we started identifying that like uh, that something is bad with them. And then we, after like jumping back and forth, consulting with various experienced people, even we, I, maybe even Sergey was involved at that time already, like consulting with that, with him, what to do. And after like four weeks, if I recall correctly, we actually, based on that uh, uh, due diligence and all the discussions, we actually decided to just buy back the assets, take them out. Before uh, we actually, of, of course, we informed the 40 that we want to take it out, uh, that like uh, the performance seems unsatisfactory. So they didn't see any problem in that because it was pretty early and we were still like, why everyone is uh, quiet. So, yeah, so actually we, it wasn't that we knew that like they are going to, but we had like a very, let's say, based on our analysis, we had a very, uh, uh, big expectation that they they might go bust, and we just like we do what we want. We don't want to be in that like you know unknown uh, stage. So then, yeah, we initiate. We got confirmation from a forty that yeah, no problem. We're gonna like pay pay, pay back this amount. We initiated a buyback, and uh, luckily enough, we because it was like so early, we got back the money. Investors also got the, back their money, and the the case was closed. And then like you. Uh, totally, I believe, know the situation, like how it went uh, further. Uh, yeah, so th that's how the decision was based on that. So after that, we really trust our model. That's why we monitor it so, so often. And uh, in, all in all, it's like, it, yes, it's very hard to avoid these cases, but uh, like that's uh, basically we really trust in our model and our expertise. So based what could happen in the future is... Uh, that uh, I believe the monitoring and everything is the key and actually constantly looking and checking uh, every asset. And I, we believe that this works. It's like we have like stricter agreements. We have uh, stricter the diligence model. So we believe all this in combination shouldn't cause any problems in the future. And we again just tested that like one week ago, just like uh, our methodology and it again worked. So we just keep improving and we believe that this works and will prevent, prevent bad cases on the platform. Yeah, hopefully. I think for the investors, it's um, really hard um, to, yeah, to try to trust each platform. I think I remember, I remember right, I thought he said at the beginning it was only technical issues. And um, yeah, then after once uh, it goes, uh, it was more than only technical problems. And this brings me to our last question. Um, there are a lot of, of videos and expert opinions in uh, let's try to rate some loan originators from different platforms and we have so much loan originators right now on so many platforms. Do you really think this is the job of the investors to research the loan originators or should we trust the chosen uh, company like Debitum Network, Mintos or what else um, to do a good due diligence? Well, that's a um, question. Uh, there is no like one uh, answer, yes or no. It's always like uh, truth is always somewhere in the middle. Because uh, should we trust? On one hand, is always no, because uh, if you trust, then you, you actually um, jeopardize uh, to lose your money. On the other hand, it's always like uh, to which, uh, to what extent you have to be involved in that? Yeah, uh, if you're investing only 100 euro, then maybe yeah, you just rely on uh, on some uh, other experience. If you invest a big volume and you don't have uh, enough knowledge on that market, yeah, on financials, then maybe you need uh, someone in the independent opinion on that, or you you choose a reliable partner, which was. Um, with proven track record, I would say. 
So uh, I, I would suggest, uh, I would say that it should be um, like uh, several uh, components in that. Um, first of all, it's regulation, and uh, it will come uh, like sooner or later. But now I believe it very soon it will come. So th there will be regulation on the market, and that will bring more trust to those platforms which uh, have licensing for which uh, already uh, applied for license. Uh, Debitum did that already. We applied for license and uh, several other platforms. So that will for sure uh, uh, like cleaning procedure for the market. Then um, it's always depending on, uh, like I uh, said before, like loan originator has to monitor on platform as well. Uh, some investors will monitor platform and platform at the same time monitors uh, loan originators. And only combination of all these factors will bring um, trust to the market. So it shouldn't be like blind trust because someone says, uh, hey, we are good, uh, please uh, invest in us. No, it's impossible. Uh, we already had such uh, such bad experience in, in, in very uh, like few months ago. And uh, uh, what can actually, maybe some, some quick advices, what can actually uh, prov investor uh, who has a little experience in finance, uh, how they can check. It's like, uh, first of all, um, there is never, the higher return, the higher risk is like general truth, yeah, general, general practice. Then uh, are you able to check who, you, who is behind the platform? Who are people? And uh, as, a, as I mentioned in the beginning, when we analyze loan originator, we are talking not only to CEO, but for the whole team. So that's why actually now we have an interview, not only with myself, but also with Gitis, who is responsible for risk analysis in the platform. And we're always ready to share like uh, the whole team who is uh, in debitum. And that should be also uh, part of uh, 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 like regular or bad practice, best practice for all uh, marketplaces to share who are key staff, who are making those decisions. So that should be a very important uh, part. And this is what you actually can assess even without uh, financial literacy. Yeah? Then uh, if you invest a higher amount, of course you need someone professional advice. Um, because that's actually how how this market works. So if you want to invest bigger volume, you you need either to check it by yourself and go deeper into details, or you have to ask someone's uh, advice. I will give you one example. For example, we have um, uh, retail investors on our platform, but they actually have experience in finance and they are very good in that. So what we actually did, we signed with them in DA like we, we are doing with professional investors. And we shared with them more, more information that uh, is available on website. So what it gives uh, to investor? Investor can uh, actually receive some balance sheet of loan originator, go into some details, analyze that and ask us questions. And when we received some questions from our loan, uh, sorry, from our investors, that actually helped us to improve our business, more, our risk assessment model. So when we receive uh, proper questions from our investors, um, we can actually even include it in our regular risk assessment. So that's uh, like a mutually beneficial process. And uh, this is like how this market shall develop in order to, to become a better place for investment, not you know, just to to have like very risky investments. And yeah, so so it's all about development, uh, the development of this industry in the future. Yeah, and you have to um, yeah work together with uh, who you can. Yeah, yeah, and we are happy also to work with you, Lars, and uh, that's also important. Uh, uh, you as uh, and other uh, bloggers, influencers are very important part of this market. And that's the whole ecosystem. In this ecosystem, we have investors, we have loan originators, we have final borrowers, we have platforms, we have influencers who, who can actually give uh, like another opinion. And uh, only if we, all of us will develop that market, that will be improve situation. Yeah. Okay, so nice closing words, I think. Um, thank you guys for all your information about this and I hope um, investors can now understand a bit more how you are working and how you will work in the future. And with this, I would say, 
See you next time. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Bye.